Hello again. So uh, this time we're going to be looking at uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verses 31 through 34. These verses are, um, this is the heart of the book of Consolation, some of the most significant verses in the Old Testament, um, quoted, of course, in the New Testament as well. Um, So we want to take a little special attention, give a little special attention to these verses. And so we begin here, chapter 31, and we have, you know, this phrase, hopefully you're becoming familiar, recognizing what's going on here. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. Um, It's an unspecified time frame, um, a reference to the future, and it is going to remind us of a salvation oracle. These days are coming, and he's announcing um, some good news here. And then he says, and still in verse 31, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay, this is the only reference to a new covenant within the Old Testament. Um, now, the the word that we translate new you have here highlighted in the hebrew um uh there this is hadash i can there we go hadash so it'd be Uh, spelled out like that. Um, This is a word that it can mean something completely new, or it could mean something that has uh, been renewed. Either of those are within the semantic range of this term. I will make a new covenant, or I will renew the covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Either of those are a possibility here. Let's continue reading. Verse 32, he says, I'm going to make this new covenant not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So now this covenant that, you know, God says, behold, days are coming. I'm going to make a new covenant. He's drawing a distinction here between uh, this new covenant, this covenant that he's going to make in the, in the coming days, and the covenant which he had already made with his people, okay? When, and you know, it gives us, you know, so that there's no confusion, the covenant which I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So when God, when the people were rescued from Egypt and brought to Mount Sinai, God enters into this covenant. And notice what he says about that. Um, uh, my covenant, which they broke. See, the problem with the Sinai covenant, the problem there, was not the covenant itself, but with the people who broke the covenant. Um, although, you know, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, you know, God was, you know, he, there's that, you know, that metaphor that we've been looking at of adultery as a metaphor for unfaithfulness to the covenant. I mean, this is kind of an outworking of that. God is their husband. God is their um you know, they're supposed to be in this faithful relationship with. But unfortunately, the people are not. And the fault is with, ultimately, with the people. So, continuing along, though, we get into verse 33. For this is the covenant. Okay, so now he's contrasted this new covenant with the old one. It's not going to be like that one. Now he begins to describe this is what the new covenant is going to look like, or a renewed covenant. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now this is not, when it says house of Israel, this is not restricted to the north, but it has the whole of God's people in mind. Um, As we already read in verse 31, he's making a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So now he's just referring to the house of Israel, but it has all of God's people in mind. Um, Okay, this is a covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart. Okay, now this is... This is very significant. Previously, 
I mean, let's let me pull up another verse here. This is from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. Okay. It says, The sin of Judah is written with an iron stylus, with a diamond point, it is engraved on the tablet of their hearts. Okay. So here we have the Judah's sin is written on their heart. And now we compare that with Jeremiah 31. He says, I will put my law within. It's not their sin, but rather this is now they wrote their sin on their law, on their heart rather. Um, And now God is saying that he's going to put his law within them and write it on their heart. Specifically when it says law, um, let me hover over this here. So this is, if you see highlighted in the Hebrew, this is the word Torah. Now Torah, you can translate it law. Um, the better translation is instruction. Okay, this is instruction. Um, God's going to put his instruction. It's going to be written on their heart. Um, Sorry, let me just read the rest of the verse. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, um, we've already shown the contrast with Jeremiah 17, how it was the people's sin that was written on their heart. Now it's God's instruction that's going to be written on their heart. This is also echoing from uh, the Shema. So the Shema, this is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. and begins in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, That's where it begins, but it continues from there. And it says here in verse Six. These words which I am commanding you, commanding you today, shall be on your heart. Um, this is echoing that language in Jeremiah thirty-one, and he says, "I'm going to put my law within them, and I'm going to write it on their heart." This is what God had designed. This is what God had wanted was for His law or His instruction, rather, to be written on the people's heart. Um, and it's also, I mean, there's there's a lot going on here. We see in Deuteronomy, and and we've been saying, you know, the um, Jeremiah is heavily influenced by the the words and the theology, the language of the book of Deuteronomy. And we in the last lecture we were talking about this in Deuteronomy 30, um, this promise of restoration. Um, you know, and it, it says, you know, all these blessings, the curses have come upon you, um, and God's going to scatter you among the nations. But then when you return to the Lord and obey him with all your heart and soul, everything that God's commanding, then verse 3 here, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. So for for Jeremiah, you know, for the people in captivity, um, this certainly is a hope that they would have, this hope for a restoration, this hope that they would be restored. Um, God would have compassion on his people. And this is what God says he's going to do in Deuteronomy. When, you know, when the people, when they have been scattered, when they call out to him, God is going to have compassion and he's going to restore them. Um, But then continuing on from there, let's see. Uh, Verse 4, if any of your scattered countrymen are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will be good to you and make you more numerous than your fathers. Okay, we already, again, we looked at this verse last last time in the the previous lecture. Then in verse 6, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise you your heart and the hearts of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. Okay, this is echoing both the Shema, but then also this is echoed here in our text in Jeremiah 31, that um, that God says he's going to circumcise the heart of the people. Let me go back to Jeremiah 31. Okay, God's going to put his law within them, write it on their heart. 
See, the people's obedience at this point, when they're, when God's instruction is written on their heart, this is like that circumcision of the heart that's happening, that their obedience to God becomes more of a natural progression of their love for God. Um, this is not just a simply, they're going to obey a prescribed law, but it's an outflowing of their inward desire, the inward desire of their heart. That's where God's instruction is. And then, you know, the obedience becomes this natural progression coming out of that. <clears throat> In the same way, so physical circumcision, um, that was an outward sign to, to people that you belong to God. That's, you know, the way it functioned. It was a visible and outward sign of belonging to God. Circumcision of the heart is an inward sign of faith. And, you know, and as they're circumcised in their heart and God's instruction is written on their heart, then obedience comes as a natural outflowing of that. And, you know, in the same way, Abraham, Abraham was circumcised in the heart and justified by faith before he was circumcised in the flesh. Okay, now there's something else that I, I just want to offer this as a possibility, okay, as we're trying to appreciate all the nuances and everything that's going on here within this. Um, and as we learned about the covenant, you know, and the way covenants worked in the ancient Near East, covenants were, were treaty documents. And there was uh, ordinarily in an ancient covenant, there was a deposition clause. So the, the actual physical copy of the covenant needed to be deposited uh, and kept somewhere safe. And the place where that was done was in the temple. The, the temple was the place where the gods dwelled. And so within the broad ancient Near East, when two kings entered into a treaty, entered into a covenant with one another, the physical copy of that covenant would then be placed in the temple because that is where the God lived. Now for Jeremiah here, the covenant is not written on stones as a document to be deposited in a temple, but rather the covenant itself is going to be written on their very heart. The, the instruction is going to be written on their heart. And perhaps... This is a prophecy that's looking forward to a time when the people themselves, we, become the temple. Okay? I hope, hopefully you follow that. As the covenant is written on people's hearts, that's because it is inside people where God he causes his spirit to dwell with inside people. Um, just a possibility. Throw it out there. See what you think of, of that. Um and then, of course, here, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 33, he says, And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, this, this has been used a number of times, uh, this formula, um, in Jeremiah 7. Let's see. Jeremiah 7, verse 23. Um, but this is what I say. This is going back to the temple sermon. But this is what I uh, commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you shall walk entirely in the way which I command you, so that it may go well for you. Um, see, this is what God desired for his people, but it was not actualized. This, you know, it was not you know, what what happened. God wanted his people to obey his voice, and then he would be their God and they would be his people. Now, with the law being written on people's heart, with the instruction being written on people's heart, this desire of God's will be fulfilled because that obedience becomes this natural outflowing of that. And then we get to the last of... This little section here in Jeremiah 31, um, and then the last verse here that we're considering, they will not teach again, each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and their sin I will no longer remember. Um, 
this might seem a little weird when you first consider it, you know, that you, no one's going to teach their brother saying, know the Lord. Um, teaching was a significant part of of God's instruction to his people is a significant part of the Shema, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm I'm going back and forth, but I want to make sure that we all see this. Oops. Deuteronomy 6, 7. You know, beginning these words I'm commanding you in verse 6, these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. So this is, you know, this is the way God's instruction is supposed to be. You are supposed to keep God's instruction in your heart, but then you're also supposed to teach it. You teach it to your kids. You know, when you're in the house, when you sit down for a meal, when you're walking on the road, you pass on this instruction. And now, here we are. Something very different is happening in Jeremiah 31, 34. It says, they will not teach again, each one his neighbor. So this is representing then an idealized progression of where there's no longer these intermediaries. You know, it honestly, it reminds me almost like in the Garden of Eden, before the people had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They just knew God. They, they didn't need instruction. They just knew him. And this is like this restoring to this to the state where you don't need a teacher anymore because everyone already knows God. Everyone um, has this relationship with him. It's not fractured or broken anymore, um, which, you know— People like me, you know, find ourselves out of a job. Um, people who teach teach the Bible, um, you know, there's not going to be any more need for it because everyone already knows. Everyone already has this relationship. And hopefully you are familiar, you know, with this, this Hebrew word, know the Lord. We've mentioned this a few times. It's worth repeating again. Yada. Yada, this is um, to know, which is indicating um, a sense of knowing through a personal relationship. It's not just saying know about the Lord, but personally know the Lord. Um, and of course, this you know this exhortation stops because everyone has this personal relationship with God. This is um, quoted prominently in the New Testament, it's quoted in the book of Hebrews. This is actually, this passage, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, is the longest quotation of the Old Testament found within the New Testament. Um, it features certainly very prominently, and it's, it's the source for when we say, that, you know, the new covenant that we have in Jesus, that language of a new covenant that we have uh, is coming from this passage in Jeremiah that is certainly looking forward to something much greater than what they currently know um, as they're looking not just to their own restoration, but even beyond that. So that's all I will say about this passage. Thank you very much.